that are featured in the book by therapist Abraham Tversky, When Do the Good Things Start? He has a chapter that's entitled Worry. I know none of you have anything to worry about here. Uh, but in this chapter on worry, he writes, it's okay to keep your guard up. And in that section, he uses this long Sunday strip to give an example of the greatest worry ward of all time, Charlie Brown. And so as you see, Charlie Brown here is lying on his bed. He's wide awake, worrying. He is worrying so much. Notice what his bedspread says. Worry, 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 worry. So he goes the next day and sees Lucy for some advice, and she scolds him. Worrying is simply a waste of time. And then she proceeds. You can't worry about the future, Charlie Brown. You can't worry about next year or next month or next week or even tomorrow for that matter. And you certainly shouldn't worry about the past. What's done is done. And then she says, if you have to worry, you should worry about this very moment. Charlie Brown is taken back. He's startled. He says, this, this moment? Why this moment? Bonk! Along comes this soccer ball, hitting him, knocking him off his stool. And he is in a daze, as he often was. And then Lucy just simply says, I saw this ball heading this way, see? And as usual, maybe Charlie Brown had a good reason to worry. And be afraid. Like many today, people in John the Apostle's day were worrying. They were worrying about what was going on about them. They were worrying about what might happen next. And so John writes to these churches on behalf of Christ, encouraging them in this doubt, in this fear, in this uncertainty. But as he's encouraging them and comforting them, he is also challenging them to examine themselves to, in a sense, keep up their guard, not only from the threats from without, but especially even more so those threats that come from within the body of Christ and within our very hearts and minds. And so he begins in this letter, he says, and to the angel of the church in Sardis, right? Sardis. It was the next city there on that circuit we've seen where uh, they had this route that they would go on and they would deliver messages from Caesar and also deliver the mail and then they would go out from there to all the outlying areas. So they were like these central mailboxes, if you will, of information. We find that Sardis had a very natural Acropolis. All right, a hill. Okay, Acropolis, fancy word, means that there was this large hill with steep sides all around it. It was, in a sense, the perfect fortress, almost impregnable. And yet we find when Cyrus and the Medes came there in 549 B.C., and again when Antiochus came there in 218 B.C., both times the city fell. And it fell because there was this shameful neglect of duty. There was no watch on these walls, on these steep sides of the hill. Though it appeared to be impossible for anyone to climb up there and make it up the walls, we find that there were big cracks in these steep mountain sides and in the walls themselves. So if a person were allowed time to climb up, experienced climbers could indeed make it all the way to the top and invade, and that is exactly what they did. On both of these occasions, there were no guards keeping watch over those walls, only on the southern wall that overlooked the roads that kept, came into the city. In 120 BC, Sardis became the capital city of Lydia, and that name should ring a bell. Lydia was known for its wool and dye industry, and we saw that was true also of Thyatira, and that biblical character Lydia was from there. We also find that Sardis was the home of Aesop, as in Aesop's fables. And so it had a lot of heritage, but Sardis also had a lot of hard times. 
And most recently, in AD 17, there had been this earthquake. It was so severe that the emperor said, no taxes for Sardis for five years. Imagine that. The government official saying, no taxes for five years. And then he involved himself and invested a lot of money in the rebuilding of Sardis because things were so greatly devastated. Sardis also was known for luxurious and licentious living. It was a very rich city, and it was a very sinful city. You might say it was an Atlantic City or Vegas or someplace like that of Asia Minor. In terms of religion, the chief goddess was Sybil. Worship consisted of all sorts of twisted rituals, including castration and suicide. And some mythology says that Sybil was both man and woman. And so yet today we find that she finds a place of honor among those of the transgender community. In church history, we also find Melito, who wrote the first commentary on Revelation, was from there. And so as Christ writes, as we've seen in these from sections, he takes wording from chapter 1, the descriptions of who Christ is. And in this particular one, he says, the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Once again, we find that Christ is the one who sends his Holy Spirit. And he also holds these churches in his hand. That they are not on their own. They are not going through this hard time alone. They are not on their own best to defend themselves. But he is their security. He is their stability upon whom they can depend. And these stars are those seven churches to which he wrote, which are representative of churches as well throughout history. Once again, he gives his evaluation. Once he's introduced himself, he gives an evaluation of the church. He says, I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. We said when we began our studies together that two of the seven churches had only a negative evaluation from Christ. And this is one of those two churches. He has nothing positive to say about them. He says, you have a reputation. You have a name. You have a name. You are called by alive that you are a church. But you are as dead as a doornail. Now, when Val saw that I had entitled this study, Dead as a Doornail, she just kind of looked at me like, what are you doing? So I decided I better look this up. All right, so the term dead as a doornail was used in the 1500s by William Shakespeare and again by Charles Dickens in The Christmas Carol. It is thought that the phrase dead as a doornail comes from the manner of securing doornails that were hammered into a door by clenching them. And when they would do so, they would be bent in such a way that could never be used again for anything else. They became useless. And so Christ is saying, he says, you appear to be a church. You have all the structure of the church. Everyone looks at you and says, well, I guess that's a church. But the fact is that you are dead. You are lifeless. You are useless for the purpose for which I have made you and placed you there. As we consider the events of 2020 in our country, everybody's pretty much shaken up. But I think one of the most disturbing things that is going on is the effect that it has had on the professing church. See, many who had claimed to be believers in Christ are drifting away and they're not going back to church. Many churches that closed during the pandemic say they might never reopen for services. Huge mega churches that had all this sign of life and excitement going on and success are fizzling out. And so it makes us stop and ask, you know, well, was there any life there to begin with in the American church? 
And in a very real sense, we all need to look at our own hearts and our own church and say, are we alive? Are we just going through the motions? Is the appearance of being a church more important than being the church? More important than pleasing God and serving Christ? Very serious questions that God wants us to ask ourselves. Following this examination, Christ then gives his exhortation. Wake up! And strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. A few things he says here. First of all, he says, revive. You sang about revive us again. Wake us up. Be in the state of continued watchfulness. Don't get lulled to sleep or become slack at your post. Don't sit there fixed on one wall just gazing out while everything around you is crumbling and falling apart. Reinforce what remains, he says. Stabilize it. Strengthen what remains. Check the walls. Make sure that they're not crumbling. It's something, he says, this needs to happen now. It's an urgent imperative. You need to do this now before it all comes crashing in. Interestingly, in this extended part, Christ goes back and forth between the imagery of the church as a building or fortress and as a living organism, much like Paul does in his letters. He says at this point, there are still some signs of life. If you look deep enough, you're only about to die. But you are not complete, you are not whole, you are not healthy, you are not well. They were in poor spiritual health. It's like when you get more mature and you start to go to the doctor and every time you go, you fail. You're falling apart, you're going downhill and things are not getting any better. That's kind of what he's saying here about this church. You don't have much breath or energy or health left in you. The third exhortation he gives is you need to remember. Remember. Remember what you heard. The challenge of the gospel. The life changing challenge of the gospel. You still hold to it. Don't you? Go back to your convictions. Your commitment that you made to Christ. To follow him. To obey him. To love him above all others. Remember when you. Were baptized. And join together with a fellowship of believers. Also, remember when you were invaded before. Did you learn anything? Finally, repent. Repent. Respond with a change of heart that leads to a change of action. Realize that if things do not change, life will completely fall apart. And if the church does not positively impact the world around us, then the world will negatively impact the church. After giving his exhortation, we find then the prompting, the prompting and the promise. He says, if you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He says, if you do not wake up and begin to watch, the thief is going to come. Now, initially, when we as believers hear that, you know, the, the thief in the night coming, we get excited. Okay, the Lord's going to come. But notice, that's not what he's talking about here in terms of the thief coming. He says, I am coming against them. He's talking about the coming not to deliver his people, but to judge an un unexpected judgment. He said, thieves don't make reservations. They don't call you up and say, hey, can I come to your house and steal your stuff? 
No. He says you need to be watching. You need to be ready at all times or you are going to be defenseless against attack. The fortress will be knocked down. That weak body will just collapse and lose its life. But just as there was some sense of structure to stabilize, just as there were some signs that there was still a little life going on there in Sardis, he says there's a few names, a few names on the roll, who had not soiled their garments with sin, who had remained faithful to Christ. Stains on the garment here, of course, have to do with one's character. Sin stains our lives, our character, our reputation for Christ before the world. Now, John's not saying that these people by any means were perfect, that they were without sin. But that they took their role seriously. They realized that they were watchmen. They were responsible to be looking out for the enemy trying to sneak in. And Christ lifts a number of blessings for these who were the remnant. First of all, he says the worthy will walk with him in white. White garments we find in scripture and especially here in the book of Revelation were for certain kinds of people. They are the mark of holiness. They're used for Christ, for his angels, for faithful believers, for saints. And just as we use white robes for baptized believers, it, it represents that dedication to holiness of life. They're mentioned several times here in Revelation. And in that day, they were worn, especially at festivals and celebrations. These white robes would stick out because they'd be in contrast to everybody else's red robes. Everybody else who was worshiping the idols had these bright red robes of celebration that they wore. This promise is repeated in verse 5 when he says, the one who conquers the victor. And we've seen before that the one who overcomes the victor is the one who loves and obeys and trusts in Christ. This victor is like the one at the games that we've seen before in these letters would wear the victor's crown and this white celebration gown when they would go together to the winner's party. Secondly, he says this righteous remnant will remain on the roll. Many corrupt politicians during that day in the Roman Empire made it a practice that if there was someone that they did not like or who was not supportive of them, they would just simply wipe them off the rolls. Okay, I can't imagine any corrupt government official any, ever doing anything like that, can you? That's what it was like. They would just kind of write them out of existence by taking them off the rolls. The names in this book are there for good. No one can erase them out. The picture goes back to Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 12. It says, at that time shall rise Michael, the great prince, who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be written in the book. We're familiar with Jesus' statement of a similar manner in Luke 10. He says, nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, not what you can do, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. God promises fellowship with him and his people who are in the book. And of course, as Revelation continues on, the book is mentioned numerous times that this book is guarded and kept secure that no one can write the name take the names out of the book and that the book can only be opened by one who is worthy and that is Christ alone thirdly the one who remains alert and faithful and obedient will hear his name confessed by Christ Again, we're drawn back to Christ's words this time in Matthew chapter 10 when he's talking to his disciples about how they will be received as they go out in his name. 
Verse 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my father who is in heaven. Christ says the one who faithfully confesses him and lives for him as those that he is talking about here, those whose names were faithful, even in a tough time standing up for their testimony for Christ, he says they have that assurance that they will hear that one's with me. He's with me. She's with me. They're one of mine. There is no fear that one's name will be removed or will not be called. So we see that there's no need to worry, Charlie Brown. There's no need to worry, but there is reason to keep up our guard, to be on the lookout for attack. Not just from without. But especially within. Within our own lives and within the body of Christ. A. Stanley McNair in his book to the churches with love writes this. The severity of this letter was intended to produce repentance and energy, not to reduce the church to despair. Matters had indeed reached a sorry state when the church displayed no life of its own and its members revealed no vital difference between themselves and the lives of the pagans among whom they had lived. He said, this is a very dire situation indeed that was taking place there. But the goal was not to just beat them down more and say, you terrible people, I'm done with you. It was a warning. And he asked this question, he says, was the plea successful? Did the church have revival? Well, about 75 years ago, archaeologists unearthed Sardis. And they began to look around and excavate there. And they found, indeed, that there was this small church, had an altar at the front. It was from around 300 A.D., about 200 years after the writing of this letter to the church at Sardis. By contrast, the approach to this little church was this big, wide open, cleared area that once had been the temple to the false god Artemis. That temple and all worship to that false god was gone. But this small church stood and stood faithful. Once again, we have that call. He who has an ear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. What does the church have to say? What does the Spirit have to say to the church, to us today? First of all, don't worry, but do keep up your guard. It's not so much keeping up our guard against those who are against us. Those who may be opposed to us as we seek to live out our faith. But what we do need to be on our guard for most of all is deadness in our lives and in our churches. Our responsibility is how will we live in such a day? Secondly, it is possible when surrounded by sin to still stay pure. This is a principle repeated throughout Scripture, but we find it here in Sardis that these believers were in a culture that celebrated an idolatry and immorality much like 2020 America. The things that are an upswing here in our society were the mainstay of that culture. And yet, they did not give in and they did not give up being the church. 
to the world around them. Thirdly, we find that they responded by reviving, reviving from their spiritual apathy, reinforcing their spiritual disciplines and devotion to Christ, remembering the foundation, going back and rediscovering what it is all about to love and live for Christ. And by repenting, at an altar like this, their need for Christ, for salvation, for sanctification, and to be a significant representation for Christ in this dark world. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you for this day of celebration as we've gathered here with Paulina this morning and the testimony that she, she has given. We thank you, Lord, for this celebration that is yet ahead for all of those whose faith and trust is in Christ and Christ alone, for those whose name is in the book. We pray, Heavenly Father, that having our name there will not be a sense of false security that it doesn't matter how we live. That it, it won't be this insurance policy that we depend on to keep us from all harm. But Lord, that it will be such a living hope within us. That by the grace of Christ, we are able to stand faithful and anticipate eternity with him, with you, and with one another. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we will, as the church of Jesus Christ, as this local church, wake up, revive, remember, and repent that we might faithfully serve you until Christ returns. It's in his name we pray. Amen.